stroke the hand in the same place and synchronize. Over time, over the course of one to two minutes, the person will start to feel very strange, as if this is their true hand and their, their real hand is not their real hand. And uh, you go from paintbrushes to, I think that using different types of stimulation better, and the more kinds you can do is probably better. You know, then you go to tapping, finger stroking, possibly even like multiple fingers, that kind of thing, to really get that body sense shifted. And I've actually found out that if you measure the temperature or the blood flow of the real hand, it decreases the longer that you do the illusion. Wow. Your body starts deciding that's not you. That's crazy. Right. So that's what I was going to do to introduce the, uh, the body sense thing. That's the, that's the bottom layer of consciousness. And in a very true sense, that's the bottom. I mean, it makes sense. That's the bottom layer. Yeah. But the thing that I wanted to point out was that most people think that their consciousness is inviolate, sort of. But it's, there are tricks to modifying and moving it, to making yourself not yourself. Yeah. But nobody knows them, at least not consciously. Almost nobody. Like, this right. is an example I just made it apparent. But you can do it on every level. So that's that one. Let's see. I think, yes. Second, the, the, what you might say is the next main function of the brain or of consciousness or the mind is to make a predictive or not necessarily predictive but just a map of reality as you go through life you get these patterns of sense data and this allows you to construct a map of wherever you're moving through so after millions of years of evolution I can close my eyes and touch my nose without seeing because I know where my body is I have a map and you can walk through this. You can walk through this house with probably completely unaided, because you've moved around here. You have a map of it, and uh, the body sense is also a map. For example, if you drive a car, you have a map of the car. You know where the corners of the car are, and it's almost like they're almost not not near as much as the real hand illusion, but it's almost like they're part of you. You might say, or people that are into martial arts. A lot of times they see, you know. A sword is an extension of the self. You know, yeah. you know where it ends. and Because you do get sense data from it. All, all the touching you do with it, you know, it, yeah. you get sense data. So things like this. But uh, the map of reality is also a map. You also have a map of yourself. You have expectations and you have uh, predictions and learned things about who you are. In, in the same, we're, all we've done is we've taken the reality map and put it against the mirror so you're using against yourself yeah so that's the second uh, that your identity map who who you think you are based on uh, your outputs not not even your inputs really right but also your inputs you know another level. third would be your tendencies these would be called habits or these would be uh neurological pathways that you've continued to burn in like addict like addictions for yeah. example Anything that is a tendency, a habit, you know, that type of thing. That's, you know, that's that's the third yeah. one. And the last one is self-reference. It's, I would call it the mirror itself. There's, I believe that there's a physical structure in the brain, I don't know if I said this to you, that acts as a mirror that allows you to reflect your own neurological, you know, emotions back into itself. Yeah. And I don't know if people know, people don't know, I'm convinced people don't know much about the brain at all. They've named a lot of parts, and even when I was learning about like the limbic system and stuff, people refer to the limbic system all the time, but there's no definition for what the limbic system is. The only, the definition is it's the reward system. There's multiple theories about where the limbic system could be and in what order it happened, so like that, but they don't, they call it their... People refer to it, and they don't know what it, they don't. It's not. It's a hypothesis. It's not, yeah. not, a, not, a, not a theory at all. But then the final one being self-reference, the, the mirror. I already said that. So those would be. That's the four-layer model of the human self. 
or the at least the biggest, coolest, most awesome self we know about right now. Right. And uh, the relationship that that has to itself is called ownership. Ownership comes from the basic value of life. You would like to be in control of your body and not have other people in control of it. You would like to keep it from being damaged. This type of thing. Uh, when you create something, what you've done is you have manipulated matter into a certain pattern or used the already existing patterns to create a new pattern. And the problem that I had with Rand's essay about intellectual property is saying that intellectual property got at the heart of what property actually was. I think that her essay described it in a sense that would be true with regards to aesthetics, but not with regards to anything lower than that in the chain. Because it is, it, you, you might say it is beautiful for people to uh, be able to own their ideas because that's respecting, you know, what pro where where good things come from in right. people's minds. But yet, it's a it's a metaphysical impossibility to own a pattern or to own matter without a pattern. It's, it's, uh, it makes as much sense to own a pattern as to say that you own a matter that does not have a specific identity. Like a formless matter, like an atom that doesn't have any attributes. It's, it has the same amount of meaning, really. Yeah. Property can only be something physical that is encoded with a pattern. And it's your property because you encoded the pattern. Or you traded it for that. You did some. Basically, you did something non-violent for it. It would be, you have the right to that. If you did something violent to, for it, then obviously whoever owned it had the right to it. That's what yeah. it's mean. Yeah. So I figured that out a few weeks ago, and uh, I think I'm happy about it. Because I, like the, these past, the whole month of May so far has me trying to fill up the holes. And the things that I realized I didn't know. Yeah. And uh, I got it pretty good. The only problem that I've been struggling with recently that I can't come to a... to a satisfactory answer is uh, the, the whole problem with the ascription of meaning. I think I probably uh, talked to you about this well, a lot. Just a couple days ago, maybe last week, I came up with an objective theory of meaning. All right. About how meaning can be objective. Okay. Finish with what you're saying first. I All just right. want to hear the whole thing. Well, uh... Um... <coughs> so I thought you'd like it. And I think you will ring true in you. Maybe you okay. can see. It so, properly follows after... After I describe all S as P. All right. Which I haven't. Okay. Well, uh... So first, there's this idea of meaning... And things that are mean more meaningful are inherently more valuable. Things that are less meaningful are inherently less valuable. And the universe has uh, created us as sentient life forms to do meaning ascription. Uh, that's our purpose, kind of. You know, uh, remove all the meaning from that. You know, but like that's generally what we do. It's very we're, mystical. Yeah, thing we're, to we're, say. we're the we're the we're yeah, the. Yeah. We're the only things... You can hang out with people doing acid too much. No, man. It's, it's not even... And I knew you would interpret that uh, that way. Yeah, yeah. But uh, essentially, we are the only things capable of ascribing meaning. Mm -hmm. You know? And that... Oh, you should have been here for that when I started talking to Jeremy the first time. This really goes with that. All right. I well, should uh, stop interrupting you. It's fine. The, uh... But... What the meaning that we ascribe to events, objects, concepts, you know, anything. There is, there's nothing supposing, there's nothing ascribing that meaning, meaning. There's no arbiter above us. And when there's, when, when you have an infinity, you know, because... Essentially, you know, even if there were an arbiter above us, you know, it, it would end somewhere. And if we're the end of meaning ascription, if we're the highest level of meaning ascription that there can be, 
then it all collapses back down to being meaningless, you know? And, uh, so then there would be that, that, that meta-meaning is, is the, is, doesn't exist. There's meaning, and there's, there's whatever the opposite of meaning would be, and, but there's no meta-meaning, you know? Why don't you explain that again? All right. The Christians. I sit in the dark. Yeah, yeah preferred darkness. Yeah. The Christians have God as an ultimate arbiter of meaning. Yeah. And once you remove an ultimate arbiter of meaning, the best meaning ascription machines in existence okay. are humans. Okay, I think I understand. I think I'll have to throw something at you. All right. Here's the conclusion that I thought of. All right. That because any system powerful enough to create self-reference messes itself up or can mess itself up, this is the problem we're running into. It's, a, it's this paradox. When you have these little meaning ascribers running around, okay, what ascribes meaning to their meaning? God does. All you've done is you've moved. You haven't solved the problem. You've only moved it over here. Right, but that's what, that's what, why. What's the meaning? What makes God's meaning meaningful? Well, that's the leap of faith that Christians take: is that God's meaning actually is meaningful. Like that's that's their axiom, you know. And you never, you know, you, that's so axiomatic in Christianity that you, if you were to ask a Christian, you know, what makes you think God is right, they wouldn't even like know how to answer, you know. That's uh, uh, Socrates. I think is maybe the oldest account of this problem. Socrates is bothering this, uh, this priest guy about that. And, uh, the whole time he's just, it, it, it's a very, it's a very good example of early Socratic dialogues because this guy who thinks he's, he, he outright says how, you know, he is the most knowledgeable person about religion in the world, basically. Yeah. And Socrates is like, oh, you're so knowledgeable. Why don't you teach me something about it? And he starts to ask questions. And very, very quickly, this guy does not have an answer. Yeah. So he's grasping for answers. Socrates suggests an answer. Is this what you mean? He says, yes, that's exactly what I mean. Socrates goes on to ask a question or two, and it completely refutes that. He grasps for more answers. Socrates says, oh, is this what you mean? That's exactly what I mean. That is what I mean. And Socrates yeah. goes on to ask it, and it, it just loops. And then at the end, the, uh, the priest guy is like, I have to go. That's all he says. So, that's that's yeah. That's very characteristic of the early dialogues and what people call the Socratic method. Yeah. Or Socratic irony specifically. Take somebody who says they're so knowledgeable, ask them some questions, have them destroy themselves, then suggest some answers. They agree. Then you destroy those answers, etc. Yeah. Why did I bring that up? Oh yeah, because what they're they're talking about. Alexa, can you hand me that glass above your head? The whole subject of the discussion was: is something good because it is pious, or is piousness? How, how does this? It, is something good because the gods love it, or do the gods love it because it's good? When the gods loving it, meaning piousness. Meaning that gods respect it. Pilot. Oh, so that's and you respecting the gods in turn. So is is goodness inherent, or is is or good... is God the the meaning ascriber? Is God the good ascriber? I think I mean which is the axiom. Is right, is right. it good because God says it's good, or does God say it's good because it's good? Kind of something like that. Yeah, it's not exact, but it's like the yeah, same yeah, idea. Yeah. What's up, Alexa? Mm. You missed the best part. Sorry, but it'll yeah. be good. Are you going to chill in here with us for a bit? Yeah, but do I have a cigarette at some point? Maybe. Okay. Maybe, it's weird. Tendencies. So Tendencies. You, haven't, you haven't answered the question, though. Which one? You mean the objective one, or what part? Well, oh yeah, I forgot that you... Yeah, yeah. just yeah. keep going for your So, time. where does the... The answer is, if there's no meta-meaning, then meaning itself collapses into meaninglessness. Oh, right. 
I, I think my answer was suggesting that because of this incompleteness theorem idea, that all it is is a paradox. And anytime you try and assert that the meta is the superior, all you've done is move the problem up. Right. And uh, by moving the problem up, you're making a floating perception. Did you read? I think I, I said this before. By moving the problem up, you're creating a floating perception. And by focusing on the second stage, you refute your previous premise. You have the premise that humans are meaning ascribers. You perform logic on that and prove that humans are not meaning ascribers. Right. When, you know, that logic doesn't work. So then, where does meaning come from? Let's... Here we are. Okay. The reason that all S is P is in there, and uh, that it's not tautologous. Am I? Do you know if I'm saying that right? Tautologous. No, I've never. That's just my guess. Pronounced. You yeah. know that. You know yeah. you're familiar though. Tautologous means redundant. Like in the uh, there, the XKCD comic would be the best example. Why don't you just? Why don't you explain? Can you explain axioms to her? Do you know what an axiom is? Explain. An axiom is an assumption that you take with no... It requires no evidence, whether or not it has evidence for it to be an axiom, and you use your axioms to figure everything out. Figure everything else out. So, for instance, math starts with a couple axioms. In order for math to work, you can't just bootstrap math from nothing. You have to take the a couple axioms, you have to say that if something... If two things have the same value, they're equivalent. Because imagine if that weren't true, you know, so we assume it to be true even though we have no evidence. And parallel lines will never meet, we don't have any evidence of that, but we assume it to be true because we've never seen any, you know, a couple things like that. So those are axioms. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. Alright. Sweet. So, the axioms tend to be tautologous because they prove themselves. Right. Was what I, yeah. like A is A, yes. Yeah. your first axiom, the law of identity, or the law of non-contradiction. Non-contradiction, yeah. Uh, Rand calls identity, or uh, Aristotle called non-contradiction. But more specifically, what does it mean? It means it allows us to do deduction. Right? When you can take two things that are, have the same value and substitute them for each other. Precisely. That's where logic comes from. Yes. All right. So where does meaning come from? Now, there's two kinds of logic. Okay. There's deductive and there's inductive. Yeah. And historically, inductive has not been liked as much. Right. It's not as strong. Right. Things but, proved by it are not. But I think that if, if you if you are doing it right, then it is as strong. What are the standards for doing it right? How could you define standards for induction? It's either you accept that it's okay, or you don't. I came up with the possibility that this could be, this could end up being circular. We'll see. Alright. The all S is P is a biologic, it's a, it is a biological axiom of the human brain. Okay. When you have senses, you rise, you end up rising up, okay, let's say there's three levels of experiencing reality. Okay. You start with senses. Sense will tell you that something exists, but it will only tell you that. Okay. It will only tell you the intensity of the thing. Or it could be binary. Like right. in a like in a planarian, you know planarian? Yeah. A planarian is little also you should ask questions if you're just just pointing out. So <laughs> I mean I Are you are you are you at this point are you waiting for a cigarette or are you listening? No, I'm so tired. I'm about to go to bed. Okay, don't worry about it. A, like a planar, I, I think the eye spot on a planarian is a binary. Like it's there's this threshold where it's either on or off. Yeah. And that's how it senses light. Yeah. And has a photo axis on it. It goes in some direction. And humans, heat is is condemned to being sensory. If you experience heat, you only know that it exists. You do not know what exists. You only know heat. And you only know the intensity of that heat. Right. Whereas, what Aristotle called the senses, I would actually call the perceptions. 
because his five senses are what allow people to come to what are called percepts. With the eye, you do not only see that things exist, but you see what exists. And this, this describes something that I call, I, I invented this field called question theory. Have I ever talked to you about it before? No. I've never heard anybody say anything close to it. But question theory, I realized that thinking, thinking if well defined is normally defined as a process of sequentially asking questions and answering them. So again, but what is, what is the question? So I decided to dissect questioning in a hope maybe I would understand how to think better, since thinking is just asking questions to yourself. Right. So I started thinking about what questions are. And the way, the little like image in my head kind of is, it's like a little dangling, it's like a dangling neuron looking to connect with something. Right, right. You're making this like dangle, and you don't know what the answer is, but you're looking for it. <laughs> and, sense, actually. Huh? That makes sense, actually. That's that's sort of like the vague version. The specific version goes into the uh, questions that we have language for. I figured out that what is the most basic question, because right. of what asks for what it is, the identity of an object, or if you're getting smart, of a relationship between objects. That relationship is normally most frequent. A relationship which causes a change in the identity or a, or emotion is called a cause. When we refer to something cause something, like if you, if a child rolls a ball, the relationship between you and the ball, if, if you, if the ball has moved because you moved it kind of, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard, it's hard. That's, but, that's, but, that's cyclical right now. Yeah, I think only because I said it cyclically, I right. think. But there is a relationship there, and it's and a relationship of motion. And that is cause. And that's why I'm saying it's cause. All right. I, I believe that. And that's how cause works in, in the realm of what? Uh, yes. Okay. Because you can ask, what is the cause? What... Startingly, what in a sense of where you start refers to particulars. You can point at this and say, what is this? You can look at it and you say, oh, it's Alexa. Or it's a human, or it's clothing, or you know, whatever it is I'm pointing at. You have to assume what I'm pointing at. Yeah. Oh, it's air. I'm, I'm actually pointing at air. I'm pointing at wallpaper. It's, all, it's just through her. Okay. Right. But through, first there's what. Then there is how. And how describes relationships between what's. When you say, how does it work? You say, how does a machine work? What you're asking for is what are the relationships between the what's. Right. After that, you come to why. <laughs> you didn't need to breathe in. Why? Let's, I haven't thought about this for like a year. Why is a very interesting question. Because it deals with... Is well, it the relationship well, between hows? That's... When I, thought, when I thought of how, I thought, okay, what is the next? What's the meta? Well, wait a second, let me scroll back one. We also have when and where. We know where when and where are. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> but then there's why. Why... When and where is just metadata for what? That's, that's below how. Yes. What I was thinking was that why is interesting because it occupies... Ooh, oh, this is even better. All right. Why... Hmm. Because the reason I started thinking about this was there's this, like, primordial thing where from the beginning of time, man asked why. So I was saying, okay, actually he asked what, and then he asked how, and then he asked why. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, maybe, maybe, man is the only thing that can ask why. Because why allows you, or implies, that you are straddling between the past and the future, 
that is, or i.e., that you have memory or imagination. If you say, why did somebody do that? That is applicable to everything from the present to the past. I'm, I'm just talking. And if you say, there's also another version of why, if you like, that's applicable for all from the present. Why, why as in what is the purpose? I should have, I should have read this down. I, I think this is, I think this was a valid thing that I came up with a while ago. Okay. But it's a cool idea. I'm not really getting at it right now. Why? Okay, let's see. Why, why of course, there, there is... Let's guess. Why could be a how of house? How did this come into being? That's basically what we're asking when you say, why does this happen? If you're asking why did this happen about something purely metaphysical that is not human caused... Then you're actually asking how did it happen. Yeah, but you're asking how the how, sort of. How did this how come into being? Right. So you are doing a meta how. All right. But you can also say why, you, okay, okay, that's a past how, right? I mean, that's a past why. Whereas a future why, maybe, would be asking for a purpose. Because if a human is doing a, something for a purpose, that implies a future. Uh, not actually doing something for a, yeah, doing something for a purpose necessitates a future. So if you are doing something for a purpose that is forward in time, yeah, yeah. that means you are, you, like you're imagining, attempting to you're, cause predicting, you're attempting to cause. You've, re you've rewritten your internal program in order for you to get something that your program thinks is better for it. Right. So maybe that is an adequate explanation of past and future. Maybe. Okay, so that was why, how, where, when, what, what's next? I think I, I, I did start coming up with meta whys, but it started getting very difficult to think about. <laughs> <laughs> but it, and it was sort of the same feeling as when I was introduced to calculus. Calculus was very difficult to think about. I just felt like the raw brain power was getting used up when I was doing it. Yeah. Of course, nowadays I'm quite good at it. I've I've gone to volume two, as I call it, I guess. You know what I mean? Yeah. Volume one is very difficult, and could there be anything past this? Then volume two is when you've mastered volume one, and then you can do it again. So let's go back this. Uh, calculus is a very good metaphor because it's isomorphic. If we go back to senses, we go from senses to particulars, with the particulars being your identifying and not just finding that right. it exists. Right. The difference between a binary and a... Or not even a binary and a magnitude, but... Right. But... I'm gonna go to bed. I'll talk to you guys later. Okay, cool. Okay. See ya. But when you see multiple particulars and you get good at distinguishing their identities or, or determining their identities, you can perform a meta on that. And what you're doing is you look for similarities and differences between the things. And when you find two things that are that you've identified as being essentially the same aside from their measurements, then you can call it a concept. For example, if you were to have two chairs, and we're sort of already assuming chair, but it's it's just it's just how language language is yeah. inherently this, by the way. Yeah. Every every word in language is one of these. It implies a group of particulars that has their particular measurements removed. If you have a chair and a bigger chair, or if you have a pendulum, you form the idea of a pendulum by looking at many pendulums. And you have this concept of pendulum is something that is the idea of a pendulum with the measurement of each part of the pendulum removed. The pendulum can go at any speed, yeah. it can be at any length, it can be made of any material. So that is what a concept is. 
in the same way, arithmetic is math at the particular level. When you say when you see particulars, that's where the idea of numbers comes from. Right. And you can do addition, subtraction, you know, multiplication, more exponential. It's all really addition. But then, uh, when you get up to the conceptual level, you're doing algebra. Because you're saying A plus A equals 2A. And no matter what A is, no matter what measurement that A is, it is still, it holds, still holds true. Right. And that is why I'm saying induction is strong. Because what allows you to do algebra is concept formation is induction, not deduction. It's all S is P. When you see all things of a group are, we're going to make up P, all you're doing, you're removing the measurements and you're performing an algebra on the world. Right. Right? If you write A plus A equals 2A, it does not matter what A is. It could be any measurement. It still holds true. A is a concept form from looking at many numbers. Are you liking this? Yeah. This is on our journey to meaning, by the way. Induction seems stronger in my head now. And in fact, induction allows us to find deduction. Yeah. I mean, which is the irony of it. But I think that the way Aristotle went around uh, looking for these axioms was he looked at a lot of syllogisms and wanted to determine rules for what made them true or false. And the rule he came up with was non-contradiction. And he did this by realizing that any false syllogism is saying indirectly that something is not itself. Right. Which is what that is. Yeah. So what he's done is he's taken a lot of particular syllogisms and inducted a truth from them. Right. And this is, this is an accurate and valid human ability. You can see multiple things and find a similarity between them. I th it's a biological axiom. Yeah. Where does meaning come from? You, you want to take a break first? You, you got to... I'm thinking cigarette. <laughs> okay. Right. We can talk out there. All right. Yes, now, now I've set the table for describing meaning. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Mom? Uh, are you done? Yeah. Alright. I'll turn the TV off. Good night, Mom. <sighs> well, I guess you're the only one taking the class right now. Yeah. That's okay. Let's see. Wow, that was a really good explanation of induction. I didn't really mess up on anything. I think that was pretty clear. I'm glad we got it all recorded. That was worth it. Right, we didn't. Now, oh man, when I when I came up with this, which I'm calling which I'm calling objective theory of meaning, I was pretty happy about it. I was pretty happy about all this stuff. Yes. Yeah. But, uh, let's, let me think if there's anything else I need to say first that would be better to say first. Yeah, we got this, we got this. All right. It's, and uh, if you notice, this was a cloud. Every, every like, if you, if you think of non-contradiction, and you, if you think of the all this is P statement, for example, each of these applies to every single statement I made. And when I said a plus a equals 2a, that applies to the previous well, two statements I just said now. Yeah. And uh, even going to question theory and stuff, you know, I think... It's funny that you, you used uh, the law of non-contradiction, you used the example a equals a, and you said that, two, that a plus a equals 2a comes from that, which just happens to be kind of funny, because that's a literal... 
step that you were taking algebra for that. Right. <laughs> uh, correct, correct. Now, the algebra step from arithmetic to algebra allows us to form basic level concepts, like concepts that can still be pointed at in reference to particulars. Like, I can point at the chair, and you can realize that I'm pointing at, I mean chair and not that chair. Right. You know, or this is a man. You know, that's not Tim, this is a man kind of thing. But if you bring out the calculus on that, sort of, then you start making concepts out of concepts and making concepts out of those concepts, et cetera, onto infinity. And that's where you get into ideology, the study of mimetics in a, in a serious sense, not just playing around with the word, is exactly that. Yeah. When you conceptualize concepts, you know, that's what it is. Yeah. And in calculus, you're not looking at particulates. No. It's very non. It's very not particulate. That's kind of cool. Quantum physics is physics with no particulates. Maybe. Yeah. A part. It's weird. Yeah, quantum. I feel like they're related. I feel like non part the concept of non particulate thinking and quantum physics. I feel like. Hmm. Quantum physics is a top-heavy theory. Top-heavy in what way? By this, I mean that when physicists do quantum physics, basically they perform the mathematical calculations and they refuse to think about what they actually mean. The most glaring contradiction is the idea that as an electron passes through a slit, it is a wave and it is a particle, which are not the same thing. That's, that's like the con, that's, that would be like the converse, that would be like violating the converse of the non-contradiction axiom. Right. I mean, I mean, when people refer to non-contradiction, they mean non-contradiction and the law of contradiction. Right. Uh, it and its corollary, it's, it's obvious corollary. But, that's what I mean by top heavy. They've they they have arrived at their theories through higher level concepts, yet they refuse to think about what you know how those go back to reality. Because those higher level concepts describe a contradictory or a vague reality where reality is what is incomplete and not their theory of it. A reality is what is wrong or mystical, and not their ideas about it. They, they, they outright say that reality, at its fundamental, is contradictory, is sub yeah. subjective, is unknowable. And when you, when you sense it, you create it, that the collapse of the wave function. Yeah. You might say it's all thinly veiled philosophy. Yeah. The the difference is in uh, doing the experiments and making the interpretations. It's the interpretations that are it. The experiments are obviously, you know, they're the experiments. But how you choose to interpret the results is purely up to you. And will always follow whatever philosophy you have. I would say that the philosophy that's led to today's understanding of quantum physics is a non-scientific philosophy. It doesn't hold that reality is an objective separate absolute from man, which is basically the fundamental beginning of science. Yeah. In order to do physics, that's basically what you assume. The double slit experiment is so fucking weird, Mac. I was gonna do that here with the Sierra box and a light. <laughs>